through that process for you adapting your own work? Well, I, I mean, of course, one of the things that's different is, is um, at least the implied passage of time, hmm. um, which in the book is, is more explicit. I mean, ravens are very cool to bring messages, but they're, they're not as fast as like telegraph lines or, <laughs> or Twitter. Uh, they're not instantaneous. So, you know, you, you, we establish the events happening in King's Landing and Ned's uh, downfall and imprisonment and, and then Sansa being coerced into writing this letter. Um, and then the next thing you know, Joffrey is getting the letter where, of course, weeks have passed while the letter was dispatched by a raven and the raven made its, made its way north. Uh, you know, it, it takes a while. And then the calling the banners, which, you know, this, it goes from the scene to, to the banners are all there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, it takes, it takes quite a while for the... Uh, for the banners to assemble, they each have to get that raven. They get the message. They send out the word to their own villages and their uh, their sworn men and their feudal underlord under men, and uh, they assemble as many men they can. And then, and then they have to march great distances to Winterfell, where the army is assembling. Um, you know, and some of this is established fairly clearly in the books. I mean, the the chapter of the assembly of the army is told from Bran's viewpoint, and he's. He sees the Car Starks coming in, and the other people are there, and we get the introduction to many of the lords. Uh, while Bran just simply thinks about them, well, these are the Car Starks, and they're from Carhold, and you know the Umbers are already here, and the Sirwins were the first to arrive, or whatever he thinks about. And you get the introduction to these uh, various families and feudal houses, and what their heraldry is. A lot of uh, a lot of exposition, but told hopefully in an interesting manner from from and filtered through Brand's viewpoint. Um, when I first wrote this adaptation, I actually changed it somewhat, I, and I wrote a whole scene where the banners fly off, as, as you see, and then you see men getting the banners. I didn't try to do all, all of the principal lords of the North, but I did some of the ones who I thought would be important characters, like you. You know, you see Roose Bolton, his ma maester is delivering him a letter, and, uh, you know, he's in the, mid -hour, in the midst of flaying someone, but he, uh, he breaks off uh, to read the letter. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and you see the great John Umber getting the letter, and he's got his tankard of beer, and yes, it's war, <laughs> let's get together and go off, you know. And the car starks are, are marching out, and you see uh, Mage Mormont's fleet is setting sail from Bear Island, and it was a it was a whole it was a montage. There was no dialogue in it, you know. It was just visual images of the of the different places that we could, uh, you know. Montages were always my weakness when I was in Hollywood. I, <laughs> I would commit montage at the drop of a hat. Uh, <laughs> it was very sad. Uh, maybe I just like that word montage. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course. When when I submitted that first draft, Dan, Dan and David read it, and David called me up and said, "George, this this montage is fabulous, but it would realize it would cost five times our budget for the entire season to <laughs> to do it here. So uh, you know, we won't do it that way. Uh, all right, just have the ravens fly out. <laughs> People will get it. <laughs> That's the the practicality of uh, you know of of having. To do these things, uh, you know, frequently dictates, uh, you know, you have to eliminate sequences or combine characters or, or imply things mm -hmm. uh, rather than um, actually show things. I mean, I noticed also that, that first scene, the, the arrival of King Robert, um, you know, the, the Cersei's wheelhouse that you see coming up, uh, again, is a departure from the books. I mean, in, in the books, the wheelhouse is so big that it cannot fit inside Winterfell. The gateway is too large so for it, it to get into the, the courtyard. It's, it's like a giant medieval Winnebago <laughs> with like three stories, and it takes like 40 horses to, to uh, pull it down the road. Cersei is traveling in style. Um, and it's great, but of course it would have cost us a small fortune to build a giant three-story uh, wheelhouse built, uh, drawn by 40 horses or so. So they, they found this, you know, gypsy thing or whatever that they have there and, and it's pretty nice and are and you okay with that it, it or does it okay. break your heart at all did like how emotion how does that feel when you see those changes and you've i can only imagine thought about how that can't go through the gates of winterfell what that would actually be like and then it ends up being a gypsy thing <laughs> I, you know, it feels okay because I understand the process, and I understand why these choices are made. 
Um, it, I think I, I was in a unique position coming to this whole thing because of the 10 years that I did spend mm -hmm. in television and film. I was on the other side of this process. Um, I know tomorrow we're doing the, the master class here at uh, TIFF where I'll be talking to some uh, film students and so forth. And, uh, I will be showing some of the older shows that I worked on and had a role in. And I remember the, the very first thing of mine that was ever filmed was an uh, uh, episode of Twilight Zone, the CBS revival of Twilight Zone in the, the mid-80s uh, mid called The Last Defender of Camelot. And it was, it was an adaptation of the classic Roger Zelazny short story which uh, I had done. And Roger Zelazny was one of my closest friends. He also lived in Santa Fe. I loved Roger, I loved his work. Uh, so when I got this assignment to adapt his story, which I had brought to their attention, I said this will make a great Twilight Zone episode. You know, my idea was to do an absolutely faithful adaptation, to, to just take Roger's story and adapt it perfectly, because you know, Hollywood was always messing up things, and I wasn't going to do that, especially not for my <laughs> friend's story. And then, of course, I get into the process, and, and I find myself making these changes, uh, some for good reasons, some for, for not so good reasons. And it was, a, it was a very important educational experience for me. It, it, I'll give you two examples, if we have the time, to, yeah, to go into it. From that particular episode, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Last Defender of Camelot, or, or read the story. This is a story about uh, uh, Sir Lancelot, who is still alive. He has lived to the present day. And, uh, you know, he gets approached by Morgan Le Fay, uh, who sends two thugs to assault him. And uh, she's still alive, too. She's also lived to the present. And she says, Merlin is about to wake up. He's been asleep in a cave all these years. So Lancelot goes to see Merlin, and Merlin wakes up, and you, we realize that Merlin has this whole plan to uh, restore Camelot. But Lancelot is trying to say, uh, well, we don't really need a, like, a God-given king anymore. We have like democracy now, and uh, <laughs> thing, things have changed. They vote on their leaders. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, well, we'll put an end to that, says Merlin. <laughs> And so Lancelot winds up battling him. It's a, it's a great story. It's full of wonderful Rogers Lasney stuff. And at the end of it, uh, there's, a, there's a gigantic battle where uh, Lancelot has to fight uh, Merlin's enchanted champion, who's a, a magical suit of armor, the Hollow Knight. There's just, just the armor. There's no one inside the armor. And they fight in sort of an otherworldly Stonehenge. It's, it looks like Stonehenge, but of course it's bigger, and <laughs> there's an ethereal mist around it and all that. And they're on horses, and they're fart fighting and charging with swords and lances and stuff like that. And I wrote it all like that in the first, in the first draft. So, uh, and then we go into production, and the, and the line producer comes to me and says, OK, George, <laughs> you can have Stonehenge. Or you can have horses. <laughs> but you cannot have horses and Stonehenge. Because <laughs> if we build Stonehenge, we're going to build it on the soundstage. It's going to be made of paper mache. And the horses galloping on the wooden floor of the soundstage will shake the giant rocks, and they'll fall over. Uh -huh. And it won't look good at all. No. Or if you want the horses, then we'll film it on location. And, but we won't be able to build Stonehenge, because the wind would just blow it over, because they're uh, they're just uh, false fronts and all that. So you have to make your choice. And I was in agony over that. Oh, God, you're going to ruin the story, you know? So I actually called up Roger and said, Roger, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize so much. But what they said, I could have horses or I could have Stonehenge. What do you want? You know, it's Stonehenge. So, <laughs> so we made Always our choice. We had, we had Stonehenge and no horses. And, uh, and they had a sword fight on foot. And uh, it worked fine. It was good. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of example that I think is uh, you can make in an adaptation. It's made for logical reasons having to do with budget and realities. However, there was also another change that occurred in that episode, which to this day I regret that I made. I, you know, but I was brand new and I didn't, you know, I didn't fight uh, enough for it. Um, you know, th the thing about working for the traditional networks is they got this idea in the head that every show has a formula, you know, and and high concept. And when you pitch the pilot, it has to fit it, you know, like. My friend Mike Cassett came up with this, the classic formula years ago for the pitch of that. He's the pope. She's a chimp. They fight crime. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Three-word high concept for a TV show. The, the pontiff and the primate uh, <laughs> coming soon to your network. So 
the network was always a little uneasy about Twilight Zone because it didn't have a little formula. It was an anthology show. Every episode was different from every other episode. But they managed to come up with one, uh, nonetheless. The, the network came up with this. They, oh, okay, we figured out what Twilight Zone is. Twilight Zone is an ordinary man finds himself in an extraordinary situation. Hmm. So, okay. All about the pitch. That's great. So I pitch him The Last Defender of Camelot, and I write the script, and we're going into production, right? And suddenly, we're casting the role, and suddenly we get a panic call from the network. Wait, 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 we can't go ahead with this episode. We've just realized there's no ordinary man in it. <laughs> the main characters are Merlin, Lancelot, and Morgan Le Fay. Uh, where's the ordinary fit. man? I mean, Twilight Zone has to be about an ordinary man, and this is Lancelot. He's lived forever, you know? He's not ordinary, he's a great hero. So. <laughs> in the opening scene of, of the show, you know, Lancelot is attacked by these two thugs uh, because Morgan Le Fay wants to see him, mm -hmm. and the idea is that she's hired the thugs. They're just street thugs. They're going to beat him up and take him to Morgan Le Fay, and she's going to tell him what's going on because they're ancient enemies. She didn't think, you know, a, a plight message Morgan Le Fay would like to see you would work. <laughs> so, you know, that works perfectly fine in the story. So what I had to do was keep one of the, th one of the thugs is like a young innocent kid named Tom. And I had to keep Tom around for the rest of the whole goddamn story. <laughs> so that there would he be a, your ordinary an man. ordinary man who would be there. He doesn't do anything in the story. He just sort of tags around with Lancelot saying, gosh, wow, this is strange. My god, a wizard, really? <laughs> But, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that you hate to see in an adaptation because it's all wrong. It's, it's for the wrong reasons. It's, the network has this stupid idea about what the formula is, and they kind of impose it on you. And that's the sort of nonsense you get sometimes that, uh, you know, can mess up a, a show when they're trying to fit it into something. But the episode turned out all right, and Roger liked it. So.